All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to set up an environment and let me start share my screen. Okay, so the assumption here is that it's the setup, which is uh, brand new. Let me just adjust the windows. So I'm here at the uh, Vipo readme file and I will be doing the Docker setup. So there's instructions here and I'll be just literally just copy pasting these commands and it's just four commands that will run and uh, everything should just work. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm copying this command git clone and then I'm going to the terminal in uh, Mac and then I'll paste this command here. So first of all, make sure just that the folder is empty because it will clone, uh, like create a new folder just to not um, mess things up. And now I'm going to clone this repo. It will take a couple of seconds to pull the repo. And while it's pulling it, I'll just copy the second command. So for some reason it is thinking. Let's rerun it. Okay. So hopefully it shouldn't take too long. All right, so now we're entering that repo and here we are inside the folder that contains uh, the contents of our uh, repository. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to run this command make pull. If you're on Windows, um, it may work or it may not work. Like we officially didn't support Windows because Windows doesn't have, the, uh, doesn't have that make command installed by default. If you're on Mac, it should just pull the Docker image now. It will take um, 10, 15 seconds. And once it pulls the Docker image, we will be all set to actually go ahead and launch it. Okay, so the next command we're going to run is make Docker run. It will take a couple of seconds. And there's a very important step that I would like you to repeat. So there are two links here. Please make sure that you're clicking this link below with 127, not this link, because if you click this link, you will get uh, nothing. Yeah, the site is not, cannot be reached. So just make sure that uh, you're clicking this link. And uh, now we are inside uh, the repo. We're inside the notebook. And uh, there's one more thing we're going to do. Uh, let's say like we can pick any notebook here, but let's say I go here inside stats workshop and there is this notebook file with the IPYNB extension. So if you open this file the very first time, you will see this thing called not trusted. What you would need to do is you would need to say file and then trust notebook. Again, just file and select trust notebook. It will ask you to confirm it. So just make sure to click this red button trust and it will reload the page. All right, so now if we refresh the page, actually it says not trusted, but it will execute. Yeah, it execute, executes the, uh, uh, cells here, it means that we are all set to do the demo. And this way, so here I just explained how to access uh, the workshop, uh, the stats workshop notebook. Uh, but if you wanna access, um, like let's say machine learning foundations notebooks as Michelin will be presenting, you can just navigate inside it and select this notebook here. But we'll start with the stats workshop uh, notebook. So let me see, I can jump directly now into the uh, stats workshop presentation, but I wanna make sure that we don't have like any really um, like large number of people who are experiencing, maybe experiencing issues and make sure, and I wanna make sure that everyone or most people are ready. Let me check the chat. Okay, I guess I can just um, proceed to the workshop sec uh, section. Okay. All right, so this workshop will introduce um, 
everybody to central limit theorem and provide examples uh, of applications of central limit theorem. And the basic prerequisites are just Python coding skills. Um, why central limit theorem? Uh, because based on my experience, uh, it's one of the most confused and misinterpreted fundamental topics in statistics. Um, and during the machine learning or data science interview process, uh, you may be asked to drill dig deeper into the foundations and explain why the confidence interval is and what is the underlying math behind it. So central limit theorem, you can think of it as if it's just foundational theory underneath it. And also there are a lot of practical applications of um, central limit theorem directly that we're going to talk about. Uh, so we'll start off with a little bit of a practical example where let's say in, in general you would you want to use central limit theorem when you have a large number of data which is called population data and you want to come up with some kind of general idea of what this data uh, is without reading all the data the most basic example would be let's say um, the uh, political polls right like you want to understand what percentage of population support a specific measure, but you cannot just go and interview everybody. But you can just go and ask um, yourself or a couple of your friends uh, and based on these answers, make like assume that every in general, the, the country thinks the same way that five people think. So in this case, you have to come up with some structured approach how to sample these data and central limit theorem is the way to approach this problem. So this is just a general idea here. And the next step I'm going to, we're going to take now is we're going to a very simple example. And, but this example provides the actual essence of what central limit theorem as it is. And then we'll walk through the code that will actually exemplify the, uh, like give more details about the theorem. So first of all, um, let's, uh, say that we want to estimate the distribution of weights of candies that we, the machine produces. So we have some candy making machine here and uh, the machine produces candies and the, each uh, candy has a certain weight. The machine doesn't produce all candies with exactly the same weight. And we cannot just go and start measuring all the, day, all the candies that the machine can produce to come up with that estimate. We need to come up with some sampling approach. What we're going to do is we're going to take a jar and collect a certain number of candies that the machine produced, and then compute the average weight of candies in that specific jar. So again, we took one jar, picked some number of candies that the machine produced, and then computed the average weight of candies in the jar. So in this case, the number of candies in the jar is sample size. The number of jars is number of samples. Again, this is super important here because usually the biggest confusion when it comes to central limit theorem comes between, um, lies between these two terms, which is number of samples and sample size. So a sample size is the number, it, it, the number of candies in a jar. It's how many candies you put in a jar, and then you average out that number of, uh, the, the weight of candies in a jar. And how many jars you, you, you sample, it's the number of samples. So central limit theorem states that if you have a population with the mean, mean just means average, mean mu and the standard deviation, standard deviation sigma and take a sufficiently large number of random samples from the population with replacement, then the distribution of samples uh, will be normal. And let me break it down a bit. So we have a population data here, which is uh, the, let's say in our example, the size, the weight of the candy that the machine produces. And we wanna come up with the mean, the average size of the candy that the machine produces. And uh, if we sample uh, these jars from this uh, population distribution, we can come up with the mu, which is the average size and standard deviation of the candy weight of the population data based only on the sample data. So let's... Um, formalized a bit. So mean of sample means will be equal to the means of population. So the average size in the uh, uh, of the candy in a jar will be equal to the average size, uh, sorry, weight of the candy that the machine produces. And we will come up with that measure without having to, to, to get all the population data. And standard, um, 
standard deviation of sample means will be equal to standard deviation of population divided by square root of n, where n is the sample size. Again, sample size is the number of candies we put in the jar. Uh, so here we have an environment set up already. So we got it set up in the Docker. We also have a backup plan here, which is um, Colab Notebook. And this is located here. I'll quickly showcase it too. So if you open this notebook, you'll be able to access exactly the same notebook that is located here. The only difference is that this is running in the cloud on Google servers and you don't need Docker set up. It's the backup plan, but the disadvantage of this approach is that this notebook is read only. If you wanna edit it and rerun it, you would have to say save copy in drive and you would need to have Google account and then you could modify the copy. But this way, uh, like all the people who access this notebook now will not uh, make changes that the other people will see. So this is just a backup plan how to have us uh, set up. And let me go back to the instrument zoom window. So if I go back to the presentation, okay. So what we're going to do now is we are going to use Python code to get a better idea what central theme, uh, limit theorem is. So we're going to start with the sample code that will generate 1 million floating point numbers uniformly distributed in a range of zero to one. And I will explain what those terms mean. So if we go here and let me just uh, start from scratch. So I will clean all the output here. And I will, um, so this is a couple of lines of code that generate 1 million numbers and each number will be what's called uniformly distributed. It means that it has the same probability of taking any of the values in the range. Uh, and the values in the range is zero to one. So in this case, we can think of this number of uh, as if it was the weight of the candy. And this is the population data, 1 million candies produced. And we will generate this number just because we have a powerful computer. But in real world, we cannot go and sample a million candies from the machine. So now we got this data generated. So this values list generated 1 million numbers. And this is the scatter plot of these million numbers. And this looks like a solid rectangle because we have so many numbers. That's why all of them are just occupying the entire space. And um, on the x-axis, we just have the uh, number. And on the y-axis, we have the value, which is in between zero and one. Again, because we have so many numbers, the whole rectangle is solid. And what we're going to do next is we're going to compute the variance of the data, which is 0.8. And now we're going to uh, draw the histogram. And the histogram is just uh, the figure that shows uh, the frequency of each number within a given range of values. Uh, to be a bit more specific, we have um, here, we have 50 bins. It means that we split the whole range of values between zero and one into 50 ranges that are consecutive in nature. And then we count how many numbers fall inside each range. So we can see here that these are rectangles and the number of elements in each rectangle is roughly 20,000. Why? Because we got 1 million numbers that are equally distributed between uh, among 50 bins. If we divide 1 million by 50, we'll get 20,000. So this shows that the um, population data is what's called uniformly distributed because it's just a straight line. And this is very important uh, piece here. And if we go back to the presentation and I'm just jumping back and forth, going to be jumping back and forth in order to keep the structure of the presentation uh, and at the same time show you the code. So this is what we just had there, uh, the, which is the scatter plot. And this is the histogram. Again, we have 1 million numbers, 50 bins and 20,000 elements uh, in each bin on average. And we got this number uh, by dividing 1 million by 50. Okay, so here is the um, set of experiments that we're going to run uh, right now. On the X axis or inside this uh, row uh, columns, we have sample size, which is 110 or 30 plus. On the Y axis or in these uh, rows, we have the number of samples, which is high and low. Again, 
number of samples is how many uh, uh, is how many jars are we going to take. The sample size is how many candies we're going to put in a jar. And central limit theorem states that we have to take a sufficiently large number of samples and each sample should contain 30 plus elements. So we assume that the number of samples is in theory is infinite or really large and the sample size should be 30. In this case, the sample distribution will be normal. And there are other cases we're going to cover now one by one and we'll see that the, the sample distribution will not be normal. But this is the key part of the theorem, which is uh, stating that the uh, sample distribution will be normal. So now we'll, jump, we'll go and jump into the code again. And here we have this little function that um, builds the distribution, sample distribution. What it does is it takes population data and it takes the sample size, which is the number of uh, changes we, we're going to put into the uh, jar. And th this is number of samples, which is the number of jars we're going to take. And what this function will do is it will compute the uh, histogram of sample means, basically the average size of each uh, of the candy inside, inside each jar. And let me run this code. It won't do much because it's just a function and we haven't run it yet. Now we're going to call this function and we'll pass here 10,000 samples and 30 elements in each sample. That's exactly what central, theory, uh, uh, central limit theorem states. So as we run this code, we can see that this distribution is normal. Uh, this distribution shows the uh, distribution of sample means and each sample mean essentially is the average size of the candy inside our jar and the distribution is normal. And again, there are two important parameters here. One is the sample size, which is 30 and the other one is number of samples, 10,000. The rest, what we'll do uh, throughout the rest of the presentation is we're going to vary these two parameters and we will see that the distribution will not be normal. That's the goal here. So before we move on, we will complete the coding challenge here. And here's the code that everyone can access. And what we're going to do is we're going to implement a function that computes the variance. And the variance is defined as, so if we have a list of numbers, the variance of these numbers will be defined as the expected value of square deviations from the mean. There's a lot of math in it, but I can tell you that the, the easy way to look at it is if you have a bunch of numbers, you compute the average of that number, and then you need to compute the sum of squares of the differences between each number and the mean. And then you basically compute that sum and then you divide that sum by the number of elements in the list and then you'll get the variance. That's what the definition of the variance is. What we're going to do next is, so basically this is the starter's code. And whenever you see these brackets, add uh, var uh, variable here, add expression here and add expression here, you'll need to change the code here to uh, make sure that it, at the end of the day, if this function computes the variance. And if you run this code, as you right now it will show an error, but once you make all these changes and you run this code, it will print the number, which is the variance for this list of numbers. And you'll be given three minutes to complete this exercise. And after that, I will run a Zoom poll where you will select the answer that you got and submit the answer. And then we will like if the answers are not anonymous, but I will see just roughly the distribution of people who got the uh, right answer. Again, we'll, I will start a three minute uh, countdown. And uh, what is needed to do here is just to replace these three pieces of um, like three placeholders with the code that will make this function compute the variance. And then we'll call this function, print out the number that is printed out. And then um, the Zoom poll, you will answer the question in the Zoom poll where um, I will get to see who, who got the answer right. So let me start a three minute uh, countdown and then everyone will just uh, be able to uh, change the code. We, so as you change the code, if you're running it in Docker, you just rerun it, which is shift and enter, and then you will, uh, you will get the answer. 
Uh, let me start the, count, uh, the timer now, three minute timer, and everyone will be able to start uh, working on this challenge. Okay, three minutes uh, started. Let's go. Yeah, we can, um, we don't need to submit um, answers in Zoom chat because it will bias other people. So we will, uh, I'll run a Zoom poll and that's where we'll select, each person will select an answer that um, they think is right. So we have 45 seconds left. Okay, so that's time. Let me run a Zoom poll very quickly. Um, looks like I would have to stop sharing my screen for a second. Okay, so let me run the Zoom poll here. Okay, let's go. So please select the answer you think is right. And if you didn't solve it today, there is an option for that too. Let's um, give it 20 more seconds. Okay, so or end poll. Uh, so the Correct answer is 200, and we got 38% uh, of you that got that number, which is uh, great. Congratulations. Um, let me quickly uh, um, share the solution. Uh, I'll share my screen. Here we go. And I'll paste the solution here. And we'll make sure that it's 200, okay, so here we go, this is 200. So what we needed to do was first, we needed to go over elements inside this list of values. Second, uh, we needed to, oops, the second change we needed to make was to uh, 
compute to replace this uh, placeholder with the difference between the value and the mean because we needed to compute the sum of diff square differences between each value and the mean value. And at the end, we needed to average it out, which is sum of uh, squared deviations from the mean divided by the len length. And we got 200. You may see in literature in some examples where you try, they like it's explained as decreasing the bias. So you may have minus one. And then uh, here, instead of uh, dividing it by the number of elements, and then the answer will be 250. In some libraries in Python, if you enter these numbers, you'll get to 50. But uh, it's just a matter of choice we decide to use here. And it was defined this way that we want to divide it by the number of elements. So that's why the answer is here, uh, 200. Before we move on, I while uh, you guys are working on this assignment, I saw a couple of questions about the setup. Uh, I forgot to mention, we need to install Docker. And if you want to install Docker on your machine, you'll just, there's a link provided to it. So you would need to install Docker. And then uh, if you don't install Docker, then make um, pool will fail. Uh, the second question I saw was if the sampling from the population is, um, can contain repeated numbers and the answer is yes. It's not, it's sampling basically with replacement where you, you basically, take stuff out and then you can put it back in and you can have the same uh, element that will be repeated in your sampling. Uh, okay, so let's go back now to our presentation. And um, we completed the coding challenge. So we uh, we started with the uh, high, very large number of samples, which was 10,000, and the sample size was 30 plus. The next thing we did was we uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to consider the case when the sample size will be one, and the number of samples will be 10,000. Uh, any ideas what will happen in this case? So in this case, if we compute the average on one in any sampling then we will get the mirrored underlying population distribution because we just sample one element and compute the average of that element. So we, at the end of the day, we'll get exactly the same distribution that we have in population. So we'll get the population distribution, but let's confirm it. Let, let's go back here. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this function build sample distribution. And instead of passing 30, we're passing sample size of one. And I run it and we can see that this is a uniform distribution. It's not as smooth because we have uh, 10,000 elements here, not 1 million elements, but it is a uniform uh, distribution because the sample size is one. So sample size is very critical, just as critical as the number of samples in central limit theorem. Okay, so that's what we got uh, now. The next example we're going to cover is what if the sample size is in between? It's, it's not 30, but it's bigger than one. Then the distribution will be student distribution that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. We're going to our notebook again and we'll rerun it. So we're changing sample size to 10. We're running it and we can see that it kind of is a normal distribution, but what's called the tails are fat. They, they're longer in, in this case. And essentially as the number, the sample size increases and the reach is 30, the student distribution converges into the normal distribution. But this is a very good mid case when it's not exactly the, uh, the sampling distribution, it's not exactly the population distribution, but it's not normal distribution yet. Oh, and then we're going back to presentation. So here we got the student distribution. So now we're going into a new dimension here to explore a new dimension, which is number of samples will be low. No, it won't be 10,000 and the number of cases will be 10. So the sample distribu sampling distribution will be unknown and let's verify it. So we'll just pick three samples, but still 10 sample size. And here we see that it's just three elements. And it is just, the, the, in this case, the luck plays big role. You can see if I rerun it, the picture changes because we, it depends on what samples we picked. In this case, we see this picture, but there's nothing which is stable about this distribution. If I rerun the previous distribution, it is going to be very stable. 
because I'm sampling it 10,000 times, but because I'm sampling it only three times, even though the sample size is 10, the final distribution is in a general case unknown. Uh, and this is this case that we just considered. So what happens if we increase the sample size to 30, but the number of samples is still low? In this case, it will be also an unknown distribution, but it will be centered around the mean because we're still going to pick the large number of elements that on average will be average. And let's run it. So number of samples is three, but sample size is actually 3000. If I run it, I'm getting this picture here because this histogram, because the number of samples is three, sample size is 3000, and we're still getting the average uh, value of 0 0.5. But this is not a proper distribution here. And we can't draw any conclusion about the underlying distribution based on this result. We're going to go back here. And this is the picture we just saw. So again, this is, um, what we covered now, which is we changed two elements here. One is the number of samples, the other one is sample size. And uh, in or, what the central lim limit theorem states is that if you have a sufficiently large sample size, which is 30 plus, and a very large number of samples, in theory infinity, but we use 10,000, then the distribution of sample means will be normal and the mean of this sample distribution will be equal to the mean of the population and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution will be equal to the standard deviation of the population distribution divided by the square root of sample size. So as you increase the sample size, there will be less uh, variance in the sample distribution. So this is another application that I wanted to share with uh, with you guys today which is um, popu uh, population distribution when uh, the population distribution is normal so here's an example performance profiling let's say you have a system that runs on a computer you run it once it took one second to run you run it second times it took two seconds to run you run third times it takes one and a half seconds to run how do we know how on average how fast that system runs we can apply uh, here central limit theorem which is going to be used this way we're going to define the experiment as a couple of a set of measurements. So let's say we run the, ex the experiment, which includes 30 measurements. We run one experiment, we measure the 30 runs of the system, we average it out. And then we run these 10,000 of these experiments. So what turns out is going to happen is that the mean of the population will be the mean of sample means. Basically the mean of these averages of the experiments will be equal to the average amount of time that it takes the system to run. And the standard deviation, the deviation of the population will be equal to the standard deviation of sample means times square root of sample size. Uh, because in the original version of central limit theorem, the standard deviation of the sample means is defined on the left-hand side. If we wanna solve for standard deviation of the population, we just need to multiply standard deviation of sample means by sample size. And now we actually got time even for the second challenge, but before we go there, let me see if we have any questions. Okay, uh, so I have, I see a question about the PDF. So if someone wants to access the presentation, uh, Jupyter Notebook will not open the presentation for you. you. What you need to do is you need to highlight it here and click download here. And then the presentation will be downloaded and you could open your computer. That's one way to do it. There's an easier way to access the presentation, which is just go inside GitHub, enter, sorry, enter this uh, folder, and then it's here and you can even see the preview here. But the notebook will not open the uh, PDF file. You want to do it from the notebook, you select it here, and then you click download. Uh, Google Drive. So the, it's a Colab notebook. And let me share the link to the Colab notebook. how we can quantify low or large number of samples. Um, 
so the theory behind um, this number of samples is the law of large numbers. And that theory is defined through calculus, which uh, makes the number of samples, the, it, it uh, approach, approaches it asymptotically to infinity. That's why in theory it should be infinity, but when it comes to practical applications, you would need to take a look at the specific area. In this case, just experimentally, I figured out 10,000 is good enough. But you can, the, uh, so why I wanted to share this notebook is because it's important to get a feel of it and you can try 100. Let's say we go back here and all the code, like you can edit it and rerun it. So we get 10,000 here and 30 sample size. Why don't we just change it to 10 and rerun it? We see that it's not good enough. 10 samples is not large enough. This gets better, but still it's not enough. This is not good enough. And if I put 10,000, it will be okay. But if I put 100,000, it will be too slow. So that's where the practical application experience are coming into play, which is, yes, you don't need to make it perfect, but you wanna make sure that you have enough compute to run it. So I would say that uh, just run an experiment, uh, GitHub link. Yeah, the GitHub link is linked to the repo. Thank you, Philippe, for sharing it. Okay, let's um, let's go ahead and do the second challenge because we like challenges and we get uh, time for it. And the second challenge is a little bit uh, more uh, challenging, if I can say so. So if we go here, what we're going to do is we're going to use our compute variance function that we implemented as a part of the coding challenge one and we'll compute it, use it to compute z-score. And z-score, essentially, if you have a distribution or a bunch of numbers, you, you need to compute z-score for a specific number. Let's say we have here these elements, and then we need to compute z-score for 15. So z-score essentially is the distance between a specific number and the mean of this data in terms of the number of standard deviations. So basically you need to compute how many standard deviation is this number away from the mean in this list. And that number can be positive and negative. If it's on the left-hand side of the mean, it will be negative. If it's on the right-hand side of the mean, it will be positive. So what you're going to do here is you're going to replace these three uh, placeholders with the code that will make this function, compute the z-score for 15. And once you do that uh, and run this code, it will print the, uh, the number that again will be listed on the Zoom poll that I'm going to run. And then I'll see how many people get the correct uh, answer. So yeah, z-score, I, I think it is a definition of z-score. It is, it is not quite a, a t, uh, t-score definition, but it, it, let's say just terminology, that's how we define it, which is basically the number of standard deviations that the number is away from the mean. Um, and that's what we're going to solve for uh, now. Let's start another timer for three minutes. And as we I time it, please feel free to share any questions uh, you have here uh, on, on the chat and I'll be reading through the questions. And after uh, we're done with the challenge, I'll be, uh, uh, answering these questions. Okay, three minute, uh, three minute timer. Get started. Let's uh, go.
We have 45 seconds left. Okay, time. Let's start the second poll. Okay, and let's try to complete uh, the, the poll within 30 seconds. Okay, so we got 71% uh, people who got the right answer. And I can guess that um, a lot of people saw that the number was negative and because the 15 is uh, less than 30, it was the only option which would be make sense, uh, which is uh, like, uh, it's my assumption, maybe it was a guess, but uh, for me, what's important is that there's an understanding of how it's computed. Let me prove that this is the right answer. So this is the solution. And what we're doing here is we, we're defining first the mean as the sum of values uh, divided by the number of elements. And then we're computing standard deviation by using this function that we have uh, implemented earlier. So we compute the square root of variance. That's how standard deviation is defined. And then Z score is just the number, the difference between, the distance between a number and the mean in terms of the number of standard deviations. So we have to subtract the mean from the number and divide it by the standard deviation. And that's how we get this uh, answer. So this is, um, yeah, this is the coding challenge. Um, I saw a question, uh, someone asked about um, the size, the number of samples uh, that we have to uh, use. And the question was, do we pick the number of samples based on the normal uh, distribution, uh, sampling distribution or not? Should it be like, should we pick the number of samples such that the distribution will be normal, the sampling distribution will be normal? The answer is no, because it sounds like backwards, right? We're trying to uh, find out a way to prove that the theorem is right. We're finding the number for which the theorem will, will, will work. The answer is no, but it is just a general guidance that like if you, for practical reasons, if you want to know what number is large enough, then you like, it should be approximately uh, like the, the, uh, uh, the normal distribution that you should get for your sampling distribution. But um, to prove that, like in, in that line of thinking, to prove that the theorems hold, uh, you can, once you reach that number after which the sampling distribution looks like normal, if you keep increasing this number of samples, the distribution will converge and look more like normal distribution. It's not like one number you have to find and then you get it right. Once you find that number, which is good enough, if you keep increasing it, the distribution will keep getting uh, better and better. I think this is, um, on my side, and uh, uh, does anyone have questions? How how want to run it? Uh, if um, we can ask, uh, like, let people ask questions here on chat, or maybe uh, people can unmute themselves and ask questions since we got a lot of time left. What do you think, Michelin or Kendall? Yeah, I see. 
Sure. Yeah, the answer, let me uh, just uh, paste the answer here. I will just paste it on on the chat. It doesn't, doesn't allow me to. I will quickly share my screen and show the answer once again, the code. So this is the code that implements the z-score function. So basically, it computes the mean, and then computes standard deviation, the square root of uh, variance, and then it computes z-score as the difference between uh, the number and the mean and divided by the standard deviation. Okay, I'll stop sharing now. Um, how would I approach uh, learning statistics and probability? Is it better to start with one? It, it's an interesting question. Um, th there are multiple approaches that you can take. It, it depends on the person's uh, background. If someone, let's say, never uh, was exposed to statistics or probability, I think just uh, any like statistics one-on-one -on -one course on Udemy or any other online resource will be sufficient. But there are a lot of in-depth topic in statistics and probability. In that case, um, I would just um, like find a specific book or a course that focuses on that specific part. The, um, the, the interesting thing, and no pun joke intended here, but the interesting thing about statistics is that probably 95% of statistics, 5% uh, of the theory is used in 95% of the cases in, in a, like what's called real world or in the world of business. So you may find that like, let's say a thousand page book that contains a lot of a theory in there, but when you start using it in real world, there'll be a couple of basic concepts that you will really need. And a lot of people may even get um, kind of scared by this like amount of material or just discouraged by even approaching the, the, the learning of basics of statistics because it looks like it will take too much time. But really the basics of statistics is that any person can just take, allocate, let's say five, six, uh, couple of hour sessions and dig deeper into that. And that, that will be pretty much it. The basics of statistics is, is actually not that deep topic. But once you start digging into like Markov chain or, or some specifics, that's where it gets uh, complicated, but that depends on a specific problem that you're solving. Uh, can you recommend any good concise resource for understanding A-B testing? Um, I, I don't know of any specific resource, but I see A-B testing as just sampling, uh, structured sampling when you just, you don't know which, let's say, uh, phrasing to use in your UI uh, to make sure that the user clicks the, the right button, the correct button. And then you come up with two options and you assume that you um, ran enough number of experiments and then you just uh, run the experiment and see the result. And based on the result, if the difference is what's called statistically significant, um, uh, in this case, you can say, okay, A is better than B or B is better than A, or it may be inconclusive. In that case, you may need to uh, redesign an experiment or get more samples. So most deep areas of statistics for interviews. Um, I think that in most cases, um, there should be just a solid understanding of uh, the very basic concepts such as the mean, standard deviation, variance, how they define not just like uh, the the simple definition, which is the measure of spread, but the actual formula, you can write it down. And for three numbers, you can compute it with the uh, uh, paper and pen. And then uh, the other specific areas that are also important are confidence intervals, p-values, hypothesis testing. These are also very important areas and they build on top of these concepts that I just described, but people tend to not um, have um, like, the, the, if you give people the answer, say, oh, this is, P, that's how confidence interval is defined. It makes, becomes obvious, but during the interview, people tend to get like lost if they don't remember the strict definition of, let's say uh, what the uh, confidence interval is. 
And I would recommend just before going to the interview, just like the night before, just read the basic definitions. And if you just keep it fresh in your head, that will be sufficient enough. Because again, if you don't use it on a daily basis, even if you learn it in two months, you'll forget it. Just make sure that you remember at least by heart these terms and you know the meaning of these terms. And that way, I think you, you will do well on the interview. And Aaron uh, here uh, shared the book about, uh, link to the book about practical experimentation and A-B testing. Thank you, Aaron. That, that book goes through some of the common things that are really hard when you start designing experiments practically, like uh, the way that you're controlling different things that can vary um, gets pretty confusing. And so uh, another thing, sorry, George, just to piggyback off of what you've been talking about, um, Surprisingly, research papers from people who are actually designing experiments, like political research, is another spot where I find like you'll start to a lot of statistics and doing well in interviews is about having intuition behind the numbers, um, which is what George walked us through on the central limit theorem, right? Like understanding why it's important and how you apply it. And so um, reading, reading papers where people are designing experiments, that's a big place for statistics and it can help you build that like intuition of why you might think about a problem the way you do. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, and um, why I wanted to specifically use the notebook to introduce, um, introduce you guys to this concept is because um, a lot of times these things are very abstract and it seems like the person have intuitive understanding of it, but when it comes to the specifics, the, the person can get lost very easily, but these specifics are not hard. And just a good way to look into them is actually to go ahead and implement it in Python, let's say, and run it and change these variables and see how the result changes. And this way you will actually remember it for a long time. That's why I wanted to actually use the code to to demonstrate actually central limit theorem. And you can take it from here to hypothesis testing or computing confidence intervals. You can implement anything in code and it usually takes 10, 15 lines of code, but it will give you this solid understanding of internals that will allow you to reason really well about the theory. Um, th that's the approach I, I, I try to use. So I'm just reading through the questions uh, very quickly. Hey, George, can I interrupt? Sure, yes, please. Um, there was a good question. Do I understand that the number of samples is determined by trial and error? Can it be determined, can it be determined a priori? Uh, the number of samples, the sample size should like, can be determined a priori, which is like usually 30 plus. The number of samples, um, I would say if you pick, um, yeah, pro it, it's a good question. Probably um, it will require a little bit of experimentation and, and data science. Because that's the difference between, let's say, it, let, for example, if you're computing a derivative number using the analytical definition of derivative, which has the infinity in it, but the computer cannot use infinity and people will not wait until you go to infinity to compute the specific number. So then there will be a specific approximation used. And that approximation, it depends on the problem, on the requirement that uh, you're getting as input. And I would say that in this case, it's, it's specific on the case. Uh, so there's a good question about um, the acceptable level. So the, the question is, if the central limit theorem applies, we can infer that sampling distribution will be approximately normally distributed. What is an agreeable level of accepting that it's indeed normally distribution, normal distribution? Um, there are uh, different methods to test uh, the um, uh, if a specific uh, distribution is normal or not, and you you could use these methods to to basically determine it um, to, to to test uh, the distribution of a specific um, a set of elements. Okay, there's a question that uh, maybe Michelin or uh, Aaron um, or David will be able to, or, or can all be able to help me with. I'm a stats undergrad student, but I plan to go into AI and ML field. 
I'm not sure what program to pick uh, for master's degree. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. Um, I think it would depend on really like your goals. Um, so there's sort of the application based routes, which could be applicable to fields like, you know, biology and physics and things like that, um, which will, you know, bioinformatics, say, for instance, um, which will have some stats in ML. Um, and then there's more the theory track, right? Um, I do have to say most master's programs are more application based, um, but that's not always the case, right? Like, um, so it depends, like, you know, do you want to go into also a more corporate role in the future or do you want to do research? Do you want to become a professor? So it's really depends on that. Um, but also like consider consider your passions and your interests um, as well uh, and really where you want to be in like five years and 10 years. Um, so Aaron, do you have any thoughts too on that? Yeah, I'm glad you answered first. I had to think about it a bit. Um, <laughs> but the AI or ML, I think when you break down those roles, you can be sitting on many different sides of solving those problems. There's, um, you know, if you're a stats background, um, you can be doing, I mean, a lot of roles tend to be like, you're heavily focused on analytics, you're heavily focused on the software and engineering aspect of like launching a product, you're doing the actual uh, predictive model building, and, and that's, you know, a combination of coding, but also the statistical background. So I think being clear about where you're trying to push your career is, is step one. Um, the second part, like Micheline was saying, you know, master's, master's degrees, I got a master's in data science. Um, I really wasn't as interested in like the theoretical, I, I wanted to build product. So that worked for me. Um, and there's a bunch of like programs in data science nowadays, so you can always apply to one of those. But um, I think if you want to do like, if you want to work for a company, I, I remember when I was in grad school, Pandora was one where they were really only taking PhDs as the true predictive model builders. Um, so if you're interested in like doing the nitty gritty of like heavily complex math uh, predictive models, you might want to consider a PhD. But otherwise, um, yeah, I think just being clear, like, are you trying to be an engineer, an analyst, a statistician? And then from there, I think the paths become a little bit more clear. Um, yeah, and feel free to like hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to chat more about it. Also, what I would add, and thank you, Aaron and uh, Michelin uh, for, 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 for the input. David, before I go, I will quickly add um, that you don't need to wait uh, to try. You can just go for an interview. And even if it doesn't work out, I mean, what do you lose, right? You will learn, use it as a learning opportunity and then just take notes. And you may even, if you feel that you're not doing well, just during the interview, just ask the, the interviewers, what do you think, where do you think I should improve? And they will also appreciate it, right? And that's why you can get the feedback, go back, study, come back and interview again. And I think that will, that time, that way you will actually use your time the most efficiently and then you can get an entry-level job in that field and then keep going step by step instead of just going into your own uh, like trying to take your own path and then test it i would say that like rapid testing uh, and uh, that can start with the interview directly will be a very efficient path and uh, there's nothing wrong with um, you know not making it through first time just go back and learn it and come back and, and make it uh, yeah, sorry, David, you were- Oh yeah, I'm just gonna, this add my two cents. I was just, if you're looking for this, maybe an online resource um, to be able to learn AI, if you're interested, uh, there's a good specialization by Andrew Ng, uh, deeplearning.ai, uh, which gives a good introduction to artificial intelligence. Thank you, David. So I'm just reading. Uh, so I have a master's in applied math and I'm looking to becoming data scientist. How important is the theory and actual application? I'm sometimes a little frustrated at the lack of theory 
in some of the online courses I've taken because I feel like I don't know the full picture, but I think, oh, well, perhaps it's not as important to know the depth in depth, uh, in depth theory. So my, my take on it is that, um, first of all, um, when, when you study something, it is just um, like the theory and the internals, it, it's, Treat it as your own knowledge and it's valuable for you. Don't don't think of it necessarily as if, okay, if I study it, will it be useful for the company? Yes, this is the end goal, but at the same time, treat it as your own foundation that you can use if you switch the company, if you switch the job, but you will have the full understanding of how things are built and you could learn about it and reason about it. So if you want to learn internals, I encourage you to learn it. And a lot of times internals, there's not a lot of like, complex stuff in it. You start digging in and you'll find some parallels with something you already know. And you will be like, oh, I know that already. It doesn't take that much time to, to learn it. But if you learn the internals, it will give you actually, first of all, confidence and satisfaction that you're not just trying to uh, um, guess the answer, but you actually know like how to structurally come up with the answer. So that's why if, if you wanna learn, I encourage you to find time and learn the internals and you will benefit from it long-term. When it comes to applying internals at the uh, company, uh, like let's say on a job, I would say that um, it may not be needed if you're like an entry-level person, but if you have some kind of anomaly you try to explain at the presentation, someone asks you a question on the spot, and if you understand how things are built under the hood, you will be able to actually use these internals and find the answer that will be uh, more in depth and satisfying to the audience. So it, it may not be like likely that you'll use it right the first day on a job, but as you get more senior on, uh, uh, in your career, and then like you may get a question answer, asked, and then if you know the internals, you will be also treated like an expert. So it will still be useful. But my personal opinion is that it shouldn't be like the first guidance. The first guidance should be if you learn, if you it's you think it's useful for you, if you're curious about it, just go and learn it. And uh, that will be, the knowledge will be the reward and satisfaction that you're getting from it. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing uh, comments here, which is it's hard to get an interview at FANG uh, companies, um, like one of the big uh, companies. Um, actually, I can add something based on my experience uh, of uh, teaching at the boot camp. So I, I taught a class of around 30 students at the Bo Berkeley boot camp. A lot of them didn't have prior experience of um, like in the field of software engineering or data science. One gra person who graduated from a boot camp got a job at um, Wink division of Google, um, of Google, of Alphabet. Um, then uh, th there were people who got um, also uh, promoted on their jobs. And the, the thing is, I, I think it's sort of like the, the um, common opinion, which is if you want to land a job at Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Google, or Microsoft, you have to have some, I don't know, PhD or some really, uh, um, good credentials on your resume, but I, I don't think it's true. And people who work there, they also, like when they look through applications, they look at cover letters, they, they look at your GitHub repos. So if you stand out, you, you don't need to go and get a PhD from MIT to stand out. If you do something that you are curious about and you share, you deliver that message to the recruiting manager in your cover letter, that will be noticed and you will get that interview. So I, I would encourage you to try. Don't, don't make an assumption that will, they will not even look at your resume. Try and see what happens. And very likely those companies will, uh, you will hear back from them. I just add to that too, um, you know, getting into a new field or a field that you don't have a background in yet, nobody said it won't take some grit. Like you have to work through um, some of the hurdles and just keep tweaking and don't take rejection to heart. Like uh, if you don't get two or three of your interviews, you know, if you get that fourth one, great. And figure out how to get your foot in the door because it gets easier. Like once you start getting a resume together with some of these things, um, you'll, you'll start getting, yeah, just the offers, the more senior you are and everything. So um, in the beginning, just like keep in mind, there's a reason grit is such a buzzword, you know, people, people 
you need to have that mentality to get in there. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I, I absolutely agree with that. And let me see if we have any outstanding questions. Yeah, so I see another question um, in that regards, which is a lot of roles, one, two, three professional experience for entry level positions. Um, so if I remember when I applied for my first job, full time job, it required to have master's degree from a top university in the country I lived in. But I applied and I got a call back and I got invited for an interview and I passed the interview. And I just was like, okay, if they don't look at it, my resume is fine, but why don't give it a shot? So if you see that they require three years of experience and you don't, or three, two, three professional prior experiences and you don't have it, uh, yeah, just try and see what happens. Before COVID, a very good way to actually land an interview was to attend the meetup in person. And sometimes there were even engineers inside, like at the meetup, they will do a quick interview for you right at the event. And that was super useful because you could just quickly in five, 10 minutes, talk to the person. If you don't make it, at least you know what to learn. But if you do, you would get directly um, the, uh, like put on the uh, next stage in your interview, which could be a phone screening or even on site. Now it's a little bit probably less common, but I assume with reopening coming back uh, at the full uh, strength, uh, like I would encourage us to go at, attend the full in-person meetup and those who are hiring, sometimes they will even do the interview in person. And it's just a very good uh, way to, to try it. So uh, I guess this will be the last question. Any, any recommendation for preparing for data science take home uh, for an interview? I assume it's uh, by take home, it means that some assignment that has to be completed within let's say a day or two by an applicant and it's sent back. Um, I, I think that a lot of uh, uh, courses that you can take online or books with exercises uh, after each chapter will contain a lot of um, problems that are in, in, like in some sense I asked uh, to, to be solved at the take home assignment. I, I personally, when I buy, like pick a book, I try to find the one that has exercises and I try to complete these exercises. And this way I can get hands-on experience that will be useful for take home assignment or even during the, just the in-person interviews or and on a job as well. Okay, I think we, we're close to uh, 11. 